Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming, and, and thank you to Calgary Economic Development and the TELUS Convention Center uh, for hosting me. Uh, really great opportunity to come into what is a terrific uh, meeting space here in downtown Calgary that I, I, I'll confess this is my first time in here, but it will not be my last. And it's a great example of uh, the kind of value hidden in cities that, that uh, the 21st century urbanist toolkit is designed to unlock. I was, I was listening to the, to the introduction this morning, uh, you know, what is it that, that makes people want to uh, be in a city? And it's you know, physical beauty, uh, socialization, and openness. And if you're talking about how you build that into a city, it's not uh, necessarily parks and trees. It's great public space. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about this morning is how it is you enhance the public space you have, create more of it, and, and really build a city that, that you know, people want to be in and, and stay in. Um, this transformation from, from uh, uh, where we are now to where we need to go, this, this move from what I consider sort of a un, uh, fundamentally unsustainable track to a fundamentally sustainable one, is the subject of my book, The Leap. And, um, one kind of leap is that city leap, this transformation that we need to make in our city. Uh, and the great thing about it is that we are not talking about avoiding calamity or uh, uh, simply you know, dodging, a, do dodging a challenge. What we're talking about is pursuing Calgary's brightest possible future by embracing sustainability, not as something on the periphery of what we're doing, but as the core of the city, as, as one of its fundamental values. And the reason we need to do it, though, uh, is because business as usual, the track that got us here, does not have much of a future. We know this on, on, on several different fronts. Uh, we know this uh, uh, economically, we are seeing it increasingly ecologically, and we know that the, the energy system uh, predicated on more or less limitless cheap energy is basically no longer a valid system to keep us moving forward. We need pretty much a fundamentally sustainable new track. Uh, to give you just in one line before I get to how we, how, how we build this into the city's fabric, uh, a single quote that kind of puts it in perspective. Uh, Paul Hawkins considered the sort of godfather of sustainable business, and, and he was speaking to a class of graduates in 2009, the University of Portland, and he said, civilization needs a new operating system, you are the programmers, and we need it within a few decades. So this is indeed a pretty tall order that we're looking at, and that's why we need to get onto this other track. Um, the great thing about this, to my mind, is that we know Calgary is ready. Calgary is, you know, absolutely the great urban idea lab of the, of the Canadian urban century. We know this is going to be an increasingly urban century. We know if sustainability means anything at all, it has to begin with urban sustainability. And we know that Calgary has the tools to get us there. We have the energy. We definitely have the ambition. We're one of the youngest and smartest cities in North America. We have a you know, tremendous entrepreneurial spirit that we can capitalize on we absolutely can become the model of what a 21st century lo city looks like, a city that is ready uh, for all of the challenges that we're going to face, not just to be able to get by them, but to actually thrive in that new environment that we're moving into. Uh, so let's talk about that toolkit. Let's talk about how we're going to make this leap and where it's going to land us. Uh, what does that look like at urban scale? We need to begin with where we are now. So let's take a good look at business as usual in Calgary on any given day. Uh, most of you will recognize this immediately. This is Deerfoot Trail on any, southbound on any given weekday afternoon. This is what it looks like if things are going smoothly, of course. If the slightest little thing goes wrong with this system, a single accident, one car that winds up stalled in, in, in one of the side lanes, chaos ensues. We all know what it looks like, and we've all been probably spent too much of our lives in it. Uh, this is a bit of a mess, but it is not an accident, and I think that's important to, to, to uh, understand. Pretty much everything we've done, not intentionally, but uh, you know, by, by increments, over the last half century of city building, not just in Calgary, but pretty much everywhere in the world, particularly in North America, has encouraged this picture and has encouraged the people in this picture to think of what they are doing in this picture uh, as the absolute best use of their city. Pretty much every decision we've made has told people, get in a private car, move from your private residence to another private space, that is mostly what you do with your city. These things that you are passing over, which might look like you know, public roads uh, on a map, are in fact a private space to be, to, to be kind of traversed at as high a speed as possible. And really, that's what we're doing. We're, we're, we're designing this city to maximize the efficiency for automobiles. 
Uh, we've done that not just in the way we get around, but in where we live. Uh, some of you may recognize this. It probably looks a bit like this today if we were high enough up. This is Northeast Calgary. Um, and of course, the, the, the way that we have decided to put the car first has really determined the way we have settled in, in, into our residential areas. These are great communities. Uh, we are incredibly social animals, human beings. We will make great community just about anywhere where we're comfortable, no matter what kind of encouragement we're given. And what's missing here, though, and what I'm going to talk about, a lot about this morning, is that absolutely vital public realm where real urban sustainability happens. These might be great houses, they might be easy to get in and out of, but they, they, when you look at this picture, there's actually virtually no functional public space. By spreading things out the way we have, by giving over all the best public space to high-speed automobile traffic, we have completely forgotten the pu public realm. And this so fully permeates the way we think about city building that it leads us to make some incredible mistakes. Uh, and I want to give you just one example, not to, not to pick on anyone, but just to demonstrate how fully we have embraced the idea that cities are for cars. Some of you may recognize this. This is the uh, uh, parking garage entrance to the Alberta Children's Hospital. When you're going into the Alberta Children's Hospital, you get in that entrance and you are very quickly in a magnificent, beautifully lit, welcoming wonderland for kids. It's got a, you know, there's a piano in the, in the cafeteria, there's a fantastic giant aquarium, there's some places to play out back, the colors are bright and shiny. As soon as you leave that space though, um, you are in car country. There is no space in this parking lot for people. That's worth thinking about. We're talking about a children's hospital. We know, by definition, this is a place that sick kids, hurt kids, kids in wheelchairs, kids with mobility problems, kids with mental problems, kids with all kinds of issues that might influence their ability to navigate physical space alongside cars are going to be passing through by the hundreds every single day. But when it came time to build the parking lot, we didn't think about them at all. They vanished from the picture of what a functional space is, even in places where it was obvious. Take a look at this. Easiest spot in the world between the parked cars to create a space for people on foot to move, people in wheelchairs to move, people on crutches to move. And even then, all we could think about is what do the cars need? And so this is why we need, to, we need this leap to, to a more fundamentally sustainable urban future, because we have forgotten some of the most important things that we need in our daily lives when we're not in our cars uh, as we've gone along uh, pursuing the route that we have over the last half century. And the way we begin this conversation is with a real street. A real street recognizes in, in its very design that it is a public space. This is very easy to forget in the age of the automobile. Every single street from the one just outside here, 7th Avenue, to Deerfoot Trail, to the street you live on, is public space, paid for with public money, maintained with public money. It belongs to every single person in the city, every single person in the country. It does not belong to cars. That is not the only purpose that it, that it has. And this is a great example of how you rethink what a street is and, and how that begins to inform how we rethink community. This is uh, what the streets look like in Seaside, Florida. Seaside is a beach community. It's the birthplace of what is called the new urbanism. And, I, uh, and it has since you know, spread, spread across North America. I show this picture mainly to demonstrate how very simple little changes in the kind of materials we use on residential streets, where we put signage, how we kind of enhance the street, really, really change the way we see it. I've been to this, this community. If you were driving faster than about 30 kilometers an hour on one of these streets, you would feel like a dangerous maniac. And so everyone moves very, very slowly, whatever the, whatever the actual speed limit is. And what that does is open up the space to be shared. It's not that cars aren't welcome, it's that they leave room now for other things. So when you go to Seaside, Florida, you see kids riding their bikes down the street, touch football games in the street. We'd probably do street hockey here, that would be by probably our default. People talking to their neighbors on the corner. Honest to God, I was only there for three days, saw two lemonade stands. That's the kind of stuff that happens when you give that space back to people. And because, because it's so attractive, this, this movement, this new urbanist movement, has led to some pretty spectacular, much larger builds. This is a great example. This is a community called Belmar in uh, Lakewood, Colorado. So uh, Lakewood's an old suburb of, of Denver. Uh, what they did was they decided, you know what, the, the, the old suburb 
needed a downtown. We totally forgot to build a downtown for the suburb when we built it. And it's now a, its own city of a couple hundred thousand people. Get it a suburb, or get it a downtown. So you can see very, very classical construction. Basically, that first phase of new urbanism has been all about remembering all the stuff we forgot when we started building for cars. Let's put offices and residences above uh, the places we shop. Let's you know, make sure that the sidewalks are welcoming. Make sure that it's clear which spot is for pedestrians and which spot for cars on the roadway. And on and on and on. The most remarkable thing about this picture is that what you're looking at here, this little scene, uh, eight years ago, this was the parking lot of a dying shopping mall. Uh, so what, Belmar, or what Lakewood, Colorado did was rather than simply um, you know, putting in a couple new skylights and bribing Pottery Barn to come and open a store, uh, which is mainly how we rejuvenate shopping malls. Instead, they said, no, what we actually need is, is a functional downtown. The thing about this first phase of new urbanism, though, and we know it well, uh, we have some, some stellar examples here in Calgary, is that it is very, very large scale, very, very long time frame. And really the most exciting part of the new, and, and that said, it did you know, provide a whole bunch of great tools in that urbanist toolkit that we need to build sustainability. But they were pretty big tools. You needed a lot of people to wield them. The really exciting stuff that's happening now uh, I think in, in, in urban sustainability is uh, what's being called tactical urbanism. Small, flexible, lightweight, temporary, stuff that just really kind of changes the, the conversation about a city and its space. And there have been some amazing examples already, just in the last few years, of how to do this. Here's a great example that started in San Francisco, California. Uh, began with an activist guerrilla movement called uh, Parking Day, where activists simply occupied parallel parking spaces throughout the city, demonstrating that they could be used for something other than parked cars. Which was not to say that there should be no space for parked cars, but rather that the parked cars should at least occasionally share that space with people. Uh, as you can see, very, very simple, you know, modified dumpsters, cheap materials, done on the fly, one day only, demonstrate the viability of it and then get it out of the way. And if you do it well, the city will see the wisdom of it and start doing it itself. And this is what's happen happened in San Francisco. This movement, this parklet movement, has moved all across North America. You can get much more fancier and, and, and design friendly. This is a terrific example of how a parking space, one parking space on a block, can make, can make a landscape and can make a streetscape. Now you've suddenly got a welcoming cafe on that block rather than just a line of parked cars. There is still room for the parked cars, by the way. We're not talking about uh, uh, oh, you know, one versus the other, who wins, only one can survive kind of thing. The great thing about this tactical urbanism is it's, it works at almost any scale in almost any urban environment. And this is a, a terrific example from a very small town called Clear Lake in Iowa. Uh, Clear Lake had the one little cafe downtown Cafe wanted to put out a couple of tables, uh, as you see in the picture, but there was a problem down at Town Hall. They said, you know what, that alley is where you know, uh, service vehicles need to be able to go in and out. We've got you know, garbage trucks. This is, we can't do this. This is, not, this is not for us. There's not enough room there. Uh, so they came up with an incredibly innovative way uh, to be able to um, uh, have, 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 have it both ways, and you can see it right there. When, at lunchtime, when you need the tables, they're there, and then uh, when you need to get the service vehicles through, they fold up like Murphy beds. You've got a perfect solution. Works both to enhance the street environment and works within the existing regime. You don't need to go and sort of reinvent the planning wheel. Uh, this is something we do at, at larger urban scale as well. Here's a great example of it uh, in Halifax, Nova Scotia. This is Argyle Street. This is the main kind of kind of cafe and bar street uh, during the summer months. You've got that temporary sidewalk that moves out into where the, the line of parked cars normally would be. This frees up the, the existing sidewalk to be street cafe and really gives an incredible, lively destination kind of spot on Argyle Street. Come winter, you know, you can remove that sidewalk and, and, and move back uh, uh, into, into the more conventional arrangement during the winter months when people aren't going to sit out anyway. Really, really simple tools. That's the great thing about this tactical urbanist thing. It doesn't fix everything. What it does, I would say, is change the conversation. It changes the way we think about the physical space in the city, changes the way we think about what is possible in a city. And I would argue that's the first step to sustainability, is, is understanding kind of at a, at a conversational level, at a, at, a, at a cognitive level, oh, this is about doing better. This is about making things great, not about, about you know, uh, uh, try, trying to you know, fight a, a war against what is. Uh, best example of how powerful this is, is when you take a bunch of these little tactical urbanist tools, put them all together, and create what uh, uh, urbanists are starting to call a complete street. And what a complete street is, is the exact inverse of that automobile throughway. Uh, it's a street that has space on it for all of the vital functions of a civil society on the single street. 
and one of the most powerful tactical urbanist movements we've seen so far is something called the Better Block Movement. And the Better Block Movement started right here in the picture you're looking at on a very, very unpleasant block of a Dallas suburb called Oak Cliff. Uh, Oak Cliff was not doing terribly well economically. Uh, it had been, you know, kind of kind of emptied out during the, the uh, uh, suburban boom in Dallas. There had been a really, really nasty fight over forced busing that led to sort of a white flight, so, so a lot of the, the wealth moved out of the community, and it had turned into a place that you mainly heard on television when they were mentioning it as a site of, of, of various kinds of crime. But last few years, uh, and we're seeing this not just in Dallas, Texas, but basically across North America, young people moving back into city cores, living in smaller spaces, looking for urban amenities. And this had started to happen in Oak Cliff. But here's, sorry, back one, uh, yeah. Um, this had started to happen in, in, in Oak Cliff. Um, the problem was that everything the city had done from a kind of planning perspective did not allow a block like this to thrive. It had a bike shop on it, it had a new bookstore, it had a couple other things, but it was really hard to open up new businesses because uh, 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 the, z the zoning required a certain number of parking spaces that were really hard to provision. The uh, stuff on the left side of the screen was zoned industrial. Uh, that's why it looks fundamentally different from the stuff on the right side of the screen. So even if you wanted to open a shop right across from this nice little block of, of, of emerging businesses, you couldn't do it in the zoning bylaws. So what they did in Oak Cliff, uh, was they recognized not a chance we are going to convince City Hall to let us you know, fundamentally change the block, slow down the cars that are roaring through here, add some real street space to, to put out some chairs and tables, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what they did was instead they said, let's have a art festival. And one part of that art festival, just for one weekend, will be a better block. And just for one weekend, we will show people what Oak Cliff could be. And this is what they did in one weekend with less than $1,000 and donated materials and, um, and, and, and basically sweat labor. Uh, you know, there was no grand master planning of this. There was no expertise involved. A bunch of local activists put this together. As you can see, temporary trees, uh, cafe seating. They put out their, you know, painted their own bike, la bike lanes on the road, narrowed the roadway, slowed down the cars. They had a couple of pop-up businesses just for the weekend. And what they did was, for the first time in several generations, created a main street for Oak Cliff. And people absolutely loved it, wanted more of it, had to have more of it. And you can see why. This is the before and after. You're looking at the exact same block. The top is business as usual. The bottom is the better block. This is the thing that we go to cities for. This is why we you know, decide to you know, have dinner in that particular neighborhood, why when we go on vacation we go to that particular city in Europe and sit at the corner cafe and the rest of it, is because we desperately want, for all the reasons we talked about off the top, for socialization, for openness, for physical beauty. Physical beauty isn't just that there happen to be mountains on the horizon, it's also the beauty of the street. And you can see the Better Block Movement did this with less than a thousand bucks and, uh, and, 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 and no sort of top-down expertise. Not only that, uh, the, not only was there no top-down expertise, the, the guys who organized it were st sort of clever enough to recognize, you know what we need to do? W if this works, we're going to have to show City Hall how hard it was to do. So they actually took the municipal bylaws and, built, and, and codes and highlighted all the things they violated in order to create this streetscape, and then went to City Hall and said, here's what we did that we're not allowed to do. And this was such a success that City Hall said, you know what, you're absolutely right, we should be doing a lot more of this, and so they're now working on changing some of those codes to allow these kind of blocks to flourish across Dallas. In the meantime, they produced a fantastic little YouTube video, and this is one of the great things about the digital age. You do something fantastic in Oak Cliff, Dallas, and you present that argument well enough in a little YouTube video, and suddenly you have better block movements all across North America. This is a handbill for one in, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. In just a year and a half since the first one in Dallas, there have been more than 30 across North America. Uh, and you'll notice that the kind of cities that they're happening in, it's not New York, San Francisco, Chicago, New Orleans. Uh, it's more like Cleveland, San Antonio, Memphis, Waco, Texas. Cities that really you know, haven't had a lot of, of great urban investment in a long time that are seeing yeah, this is fast and cheap and easy. We got to start doing this. Uh, here's a great example. This is Oklahoma City where you know, for a couple of days they, they, they threw up a better block. Really same kind of tools, cheap, lightweight, easy to take down when you're done, demonstrating just for a couple of days that there is more to the street than cars. Here's a slightly different conf configuration. This is in Wichita, Kansas. Again, demonstrating very, very simple, quick, easy, cheap tools 
can really change how people think about a physical space. That intersection right there looks like, I don't know how many hundred intersections in Calgary, how many thousands and thousands of intersections across North America that currently feel openly hostile to anything other than an automobile. And really, really simply over the course of a weekend, you can change that. And the great thing is if it works, it's really easy to replicate. Uh, it works really in almost any kind of configuration, whether it's top down or bottom up in terms of the planning. Here's another example. This is Urbana, Illinois. This is a top down uh, transformation, not as dramatic as some of the better blocks, but demonstrates that this stuff can be put right into uh, an entire city's code and really change the landscape. And, and, and uh, one of the things it begins to do is allow for that sort of finer grained ur 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 urbanity, allow, allows people to see the value of things like increasing density in their neighborhoods, having more people on the street, having better access to transit, all the stuff that we know needs to happen for the larger sustainability picture to work in a city. Uh, I think that this is just an enormous opportunity staring us in the face. And the great thing here in Calgary, uh, to switch gears to what we need to be doing here, here in Calgary, is that we have already begun. We're already several steps ahead of some of these sort of, sort of uh, harder luck Midwestern towns in the United States in that we've been booming. We've got lots of money. We've got lots of talent. We have got more than enough resources. And we've already demonstrated we really like this stuff. I mean, this is Garrison Woods. This is one of the first really large scale new urbanist builds in, in, in North America, one of the most successful, I would argue, in North America as well. Uh, all the same stuff that, that you know, began in, in, with the seaside experiment 30 years ago in Florida building a sidewalk that is wide enough for people to actually use, letting people live and work above, uh, above businesses, all the stuff that we know works and has always worked in the, in the urban environment. It can be adapted, it can be reused, it, 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 it really is the kind of fundamental building block of a successful city. But we've done that in Garrison Woods, but of course you don't always have, you know, an abandoned military base and a whole bunch of money and a public-private par partnership w willing to wait out all of the variances that they need to get in the bylaws to do what they did in Garrison Woods. Fortunately, we've also already started, without even really meaning to, to become tactical urbanists here in Calgary. And the great example of this, to my mind, has been the enormous success of Calgary's food truck pilot project. Uh, food trucks are not just about food. Uh, not to say that they aren't also about food, because there's some terrific food to be had at Calgary's food, food trucks, but really what you can do with a couple of food trucks is take something that, look, that didn't look like much at all and turn it into a vibrant street scene. And this is a great example. Some of you may have been at this. This was the uh, one-year anniversary of the food truck pilot project. Basically, 19 of them all went and parked over by the, the Simmons warehouse in the East Village. And I'm pretty sure that ha had to be, you know, since the, you know, I don't know how long, the busiest street scene anyone had seen in the East Village in Calgary in, in, in several generations. 19 food trucks, it was organized mainly with a couple of messages on Twitter and Facebook and a notice in the Calgary Herald, cost next to nothing, d you know, took almost nothing to organize, and for an entire afternoon, everyone who showed up, and they showed up by the hundreds, saw just how viable that East Village street scene is going to be. Terrific, easy, quick, cheap, temporary, tactical urbanism in action. We've uh, done this a few other ways as well. Uh, here's a great example of what happens if you give Calgarians permission to use back alleys as something other than car right-of-ways. Uh, this is the alley behind the, the, the Grand Theater. Uh, this was a, 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 a unsanctioned uh, uh, tactical urbanist intervention after the, the uh, theater junction moved into the Grand Theater. They decided to throw a party in the alleyway. Uh, one of the things I like to point out Part of the reason why I think that it's such a crowded scene is that we only had the one alleyway. So if we had a whole network of alleyways all through downtown, which we're pursuing, and, and, and there's some great work being done on in City Hall, we could spread out a little. We wouldn't all have to crowd into this one alleyway. But this demonstrates just how much we want this stuff. This is one of the great things about tactical urbanism. You don't have to you know, make an argument for it. You don't have to send out invitations and beg people to come. All you have to do is give permission, and people flock to this as we always have to great public space. We desperately want it. We're those social animals, so desperate to be out with other people, especially in Canada, where there are certain months where it isn't that nice to be out on the street. During the months where it is, we should absolutely just be, you know, uh, all, all systems go, every single space we can, give it back to people. I think part of the reason why you see things like that incredible Red Mile celebration in Calgary, yes, we were all very excited about the Calgary Flames and, and, and coming within one game of the, of the Stanley Cup, but we were also really excited in June to be outside. And I think that was a big part of that celebration. And uh, would be the kind of thing, I bet even without a Flames run, we could probably get some streets filled with people. Uh, I think we've got some other resources in Calgary. 
in that urban sustainability toolkit that uh, uh, we don't always uh, take advantage of. So I'd like to talk a little bit about not just the urban landscape, but also how we power it and how we get around in it. First, how do we power it? There's a huge asset staring us in the face. We've all seen this picture a thousand times, I'm sure. This is what the Calgary skyline looks like. It's easy to miss the enormous asset we have. I don't know if you can see it there. It's, it's way in the background. It's that incredible blue sky that we have overhead 300 days a year. We have probably the best urban solar resource in Canada. We get 300 days of sunshine. This is a city that could be the solar capital of North America, and we're already starting. It's easier to see in this picture where that fantastic resource is. This is the, the new bank of solar panels on City Hall. It's staring us in the face. We have you know, nothing but opportunity in the renewable energy what, what realm in Calgary. And instead of just looking at you know, the conventional energy resources we have, we really need to start thinking, could we be a global energy capital on all fronts? And I would argue we can. We do have some catching up to do, however. There are other jurisdictions where uh, uh, the initiative has been taken much more uh, uh, strongly. This is in, in southern Germany. In a town in Bavaria, as you can see, nearly every single house in town has got a solar panel on it. This is not because it is so sunny and warm in Bavaria. Bavaria is at a, a, the, where, where this picture is taken, about the same latitude as Waterton Park. Uh, and nowhere near as sunny. This is just because Germany has absolutely exemplary government leadership at all levels on renewable energy, got serious about it and decided we are going to lead the world in this. And as you can see, people, whether they be German or Calgarian, love the idea of capturing that solar energy that's on them all the time. Uh, we've already begun to do some other things, I think, in Calgary. We uh, have a really, really strong wind energy sector, for example. Um, some of the best wind resources in Canada sit right on our doorstep. We've begun to exploit them, but I don't think nearly as seriously as we could. And, uh, and we haven't really seen the whole potential of them. Here's a great example of this. This is a fantastic Calgary entrepreneurial story, the kind of thing that you know, makes us a great city to do business in. Uh, there's a company here in town, some of you may know it, called Greengate. Greengate is a wind developer. And Greengate is currently under uh, a contract to produce and build I think it's Canada's largest wind farm. It's definitely the largest wind farm in, in, in Alberta. I think it's Canada's largest. And the way Greengate is financing that wind farm is by selling carbon offsets to companies in California. So where there's a will, there's a way. It's a great little entrepreneurial story of a Calgary, Calgarian company saying, we have the wind resource. We know it's got to be valuable to someone. Oh, it's valuable to California because they live in a forward-thinking uh, uh, kind of front-edge um, Low, uh, emissions jurisdiction will sell to them. But the obvious answer is, or question is, why are we selling our wind, at least, at least you know, sort of, sort, sort of uh, uh, functionally, to California companies, when we have lots of companies here in, in, in Alberta that could have a huge strategic advantage if they could erase their carbon footprint? I'm thinking here of you know, that, that tricky statistic that attaches itself to barrels of Alberta oil, that it does have a slightly larger carbon footprint than every other barrel of oil uh, out there. There's absolutely no reason other than a total failure of leadership at the higher levels of government that we are not already doing that in Alberta. So we obviously have the people, we obviously have the resource, what we don't have uh, is the leadership. And uh, we've even got some real state-of-the-art stuff. Uh, not everyone knows this, our sea trains are all wind-powered. We actually have uh, a, a municipal government with probably the small, I believe, the smallest footprint of any municipal government in, in, in Canada. Uh, I, I believe it's near zero now. It's almost entirely uh, wind-powered now, our, our, our municipal government. And this is a fantastic, in addition to being wind-powered, a fantastic, state-of-the-art, excellent backbone of a great transit system. The only trouble I have with the C train, and I was on one coming here this morning, uh, and I was, I was barely on it. I was actually kind of like this, uh, as some of you know, uh, up against the, the, the windows as more people kind of crowded on. The trouble with the C train is it was a state-of-the-art, fantastic backbone of, of a transit system for the Calgary of the 1988 Olympics. And the Calgary of today is now literally twice the size of the Calgary of the 1988 Olympics, and we have not kept up in terms of our, our, our development. And we've tried to patch in the holes, but there's a big difference between a C-train platform and your average Calgary bus stop. And it explains why you know, some people will tell you, oh, you know, we've tried to provide transit to Calgarians. It's not what they want. Well, take a look at this. This, this is in Acadia. This is not, I didn't have to go out of my way to find this. 
Uh, I like to think of this, this is obviously where if you are uh, part, doing the first part of your commute by helicopter, you get dropped in to your bus stop and then carry on along your way. Think about what this stop, bus stop must look like today. It hasn't been plowed yet. You'd be standing in you know, a half foot of snow with cars driving by you, pouring slush on you. You've already trudged through the snow from the sidewalk to get to the little landing pad. You would be standing there. Your every thought for the last couple of days of your commute is, how do I get off these buses? I've got to find a job that can get me so I don't have to ride this bus anymore. Everything about the system is telling you, don't use this. Find another way. What if it was awesome? What if transit was the best way in every circumstance? What if bus stops looked like something that was welcoming to someone who has to stand out in the cold in, in, in the Canadian environment? Here's a great example. This is a new BRT stop in, in Brampton. Amazing technology they have developed. Some of you might be familiar with it. It's called interior space heating. And this is an interior space heated bus stop for those cold days. I think this could catch on in Canada. I think this could be big. <laughs> I think there's a great opportunity waiting for us here if we actually think to ourselves, hey, wait a minute, people have to stand out in the cold to get on the bus. No one's going to want to do that. What if we went one step further than they have in Toronto? What if we had a solar heated, interior space heated bus stop? That would not be that hard to do. If we gave any thought at all to the passive solar heat falling onto every single bus stop in, in town, I guarantee you there are, in, in, are there are engineers in town who could make that work. It's not that complicated. We could have solar heated bus stops across the city. It could be something we talk about every time people bash on Calgary for being the oil capital. Well, yeah, all well and good, but our C trains wind powered and our, and our bus stops are solar powered. What are you doing for the 21st century? Really, really easy argument to make. I think it would create some, that, that sense we've already got, that huge sense of pride in our city, really bring it you know, right onto the street, show it, show it you know, fly that flag. And then I think it could set the stage for what I really think is the, the big, ambitious urban sustainability project of the 21st century for Calgary, which is to become, once again, a city that knows trains. Um, a city that knows lots of trains. I don't know if you know what this is. This is a, a passenger rail station. Uh, this is something you will still find in many cities around the world. There are these trains that come that people get on, not luxury tourists and not potash. People get onto the train and go somewhere nearby and then get off. And then they can come back on the train as well. It's an amazing system. Um, and people love it when it's done right. In, in fact, people love it so much that you, you, know, you could barely get on to uh, uh, Alberta's great recent rail experiment. If you wanted to ride an Alberta train, of course, you know where, where you had to be to do it. If you were in Vancouver for the 2012 Olympics, the Alberta government was happy to take you by train uh, up to Whistler. That was that, that, you know, recognizing the enormous value of trains, recognizing the huge opportunity that we have uh, if, if we can get sort of into this 21st century rail economy. Uh, we did that with, you know, Al uh, Alberta taxpayer money in Vancouver. Um, and I'm not going to chide the Alberta government for doing that. I'm going to uh, uh, call them to account for, for that and say that was an excellent pilot project for the regional rail system that we need in Alberta today. Uh, this can't possibly be rocket science. It's, it's rail science, in fact. Uh, this is a, a very typical Danish state rail regional train. I've rid, ridden a bunch of them doing research on, on Denmark. This particular one is exactly the kind that goes. You get on it in a town of about 5,000 people, and you go to another town of about 5,000 people, and it eventually ends at a town of about 20,000 people. There is no urban hub that it is serving. They do rail in, region, in, in, in you know, the small towns of Denmark, fast, efficient, comfortable, cheap transit without an urban hub. So surely if they can make that work, if there's a way to make the economics work from some little town you've never heard of in Denmark to some other little town you've never heard of in Denmark, we should be able to figure out a way to do it Calgary to Banff, Calgary to Airdrie, Calgary to Okotoks, Calgary to Fort McLeod. There has to be a way to make that economics work. And there is a way to make that economics work. It just takes that leap to say, you know what? Cars are not going to be the only way we get between cities in, in, in this province and in this country anymore. We do want to jump onto these fast trains of the 21st century. And that would lead, if we had a great regional rail system, to the ultimate prize, what I think of as you know, the hallmark of, of 21st century urban sustainability refinement, which is high-speed rail. 
High-speed rail is fundamentally transformative, not just in how you get around, but basically in the entire way you think about the geographic space you're in. This is the Ave train uh, that now moves between large cities in Spain. A great example for, for Alberta and for Canada generally because, one, Spain started off with a terrible, terrible train system. If any of you rode Spanish trains a generation ago, they, they were different gauges. You would have to get off in the middle of nowhere to get off one train onto another. Um, you know, it was a... It was a you just a, just a mess. And what the Spanish government decided is, let's not build pretty good, let's build the best in Europe. And so in the space of 20 years, they've linked all the major cities in Spain by these high-speed trains, vastly reducing the travel time between those cities, eliminating air traffic between those cities because people would way rather get on a high-speed train and maintain their dignity than have to do the ritual dance that we now have to do to get on an airplane to travel one hour to Edmonton. Um, one of the other really transformative things about high-speed rail is what happens in between. So uh, when they were planning the Spanish system, all of the emphasis was on how do you get from Madrid to Seville, how do you get from Madrid to Barcelona. But what happened was uh, those stops along the way, there weren't many, but at every single one, they fundamentally reinvented the urban environment. So the first train from Madrid to Seville, very first stop out of Madrid, about 45 minutes, a city called Ciudad Real. Ciudad Real was absolutely off the map. It took a couple hours even by car on crappy roads to get to from Madrid, if the traffic was good coming out of Madrid, which it really was. All of a sudden it was 45 minutes from the center of Madrid. Not only could people start buying cheap property in, in, in Ciudad Real and commuting in, but it meant that the university and the hospital and all the other sort of professional facilities in Ciudad Real could now attract talent from Madrid that commutes out. So not only did you have you know, an enhancement in terms of that sort of bedroom community stuff, this is suddenly now a place on the map. So imagine, and we've done the studies, and we know it would work, we know the traffic would be there, we know that we could make it work, that there was a high-speed rail station in downtown Calgary served by a regional rail network that ends in all kinds of great little urbanist hubs. And you get on the train, and about an hour later, you're in Edmonton, center of Edmonton. And along the way, at the halfway point, you hit Red Deer, which is now the obvious meeting space for just about everyone who ever has to have meetings in Edmonton or meetings in Calgary, because it's half an hour. You could go for lunch and come back. Fundamentally transform the way we imagine the province. Fundamentally transform the way we imagine Calgary as the economic hub of the province and its relation to all the places around it. This would be a huge leap for, for, for Alberta. It's the kind of thing that with the right kind of leadership, we would recognize, why would we wait until someone else does it better and then, and then follow along? Aren't we as a city and as a province and as a country ready to lead some of this stuff? Aren't we ready to say, you know what? We don't want pretty good. We want people to come to Calgary and say, this is the, 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 the most exciting city I have ever seen. You guys are doing everything right. I think we're already halfway there in Calgary. I think all of our energy is pointed in the right direction. All we need is that push. All we need is people pushing from below, the right kind of leadership from above, and everyone will know. Calgary is, in fact, the great 21st century urban ideal lab. It's why I live here. It's why I love living here. And it's why I think the soul of the city conversation is so important, because we need to recognize the future is now. All the tools are here. All we really have to do is sort of reach out, grab them, make them ours, make them work, and people will just gaze in awe at Canada's first great city of the 21st century. Uh, and with that, I will, I will hand it over to the panel. Thank you all for your time.